it is for you to start this out. Yeah, Matthew. Good afternoon. Uh, I am Matthew Seawood and I'm your co-host this afternoon. Um, I'm the co-founder of the Just Action Coalition, uh, which is a nonprofit youth organization centered around police reform. Um, I recently graduated from De La Salle High School in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And in the fall, I will be attending Morehouse College. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ayo Olagbaju, and I'm a recent graduate of Patrick Henry High School. In the fall, I will be attending Howard University to study journalism. And we are so excited to have you here today, Ezra. Good afternoon. My name is Ezra Davis. Um, I too will be co-hosting as well. I am a sophomore at Penn State uh, University studying digital multimedia design. And I also am an executive of ED Leg Legacy um, Studios. Today we will discuss the double pandemics of racism and COVID-19. We will highlight four sections, education, personal life, faith, and social justice. We will hear from our panelists for each of these sections, as well as a few youth contributors. Um, quickly, we would like to uh, take this time to honor Congressman John Lewis. Um, if not us, then who? If not now, then when? These words echo in the hearts and minds of people worldwide and we follow in the footsteps of this civil rights icon. So we wanna definitely get into introducing our panelists today. I right, you can go ahead. All right, um, first, we will be introducing our first panelist, which is Dr. Berenicia Johnson Eanes who is the interim president of New York College right now. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. So, so I'm excited to say that I'm not the interim anymore. I'm the president of York College in the City University of New York. I was appointed about, <laughs> thank you so much. I was appointed about a week and a half ago. And thank wow. you so much, um, Robert, and all of the community for inviting me. Thank you for having me here. Glad to have you. Johnson is a clinical coordinator and assistant professor of counseling of psychology. Hi. Um, I hope I'm. I think there's double play. I, I, I just heard Dr. Eanes again. Sorry. Okay. All right. We can hear you, Dr. Thompson. Okay. okay, awesome, thank you. I think there's double play. I, I just heard Dr. Haynes again. Okay, and our next presenter uh, would be none other than Pastor Kevin Tucker, a youth pastor of the Faith Center in Sunrise, Florida. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Ezra. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started with our first section of education, and I'll hand it over to Io. All right. So um, first today, we will be moving to the education section. So lately, in the past few months, we have our worlds have been completely shifted due to the pandemic of coronavirus, COVID-19. Um, students who were in school in the spring were suddenly, um, were suddenly told that they would need to be staying home due to all of the restrictions. And that has had a huge, huge impact on students across the world, especially here in the States. Um, it has affected people from our elementary ages all the way up to college even. So today we are gonna be hearing from Dr. Eanes as well as Ms. Bria Banks and Mr. Miles Mays. And they will just be sharing some of their experiences on how COVID-19 has affected their personal experience. 
So um, first I'll start off with Dr. Eanes. From your perspective, how has COVID-19 affected education just overall? Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. So my apologies, I'm multitasking today. So I have to no be um, in a mo many modes. So first of all, I want to say that um, nobody could have expected when we went into this academic year that we would be facing a pandemic. Um, it is probably the first time for many people um, to have to deal with this kind of challenge on several levels. Um, because I work in the City University of New York and we serve a large amount of underrepresented students, uh, first generation students, my experience with my students has been um, extremely profound, my students, faculty and staff. So one of the things um, that I've been talking about in many spaces is an understanding of the trauma, right? The econ economic impact, but also the profound um, sort of space where we're trying to navigate not knowing what's gonna happen next. Um, mm -hmm. In many spaces, I'm sure you all have seen nationally this conversation about what's going to happen in the fall, um, the economic impact for people. Um, if the students have to be virtual, would they really want to come back to school? What does that mean for enrollment for um, spaces? Um, from a K through 12 perspective, there are many people who are continuing to try to digest what it means for our young people to not be in school in the same way. What is the impact of that on our families, right? And so uh, many of you all, other people that have known me throughout my career, what I say is education is the social justice question of our century. Mm -hmm. We know that there are several um, spaces that we have to navigate around um, access and opportunity. And that's what we have to really think about, right? Right. Um, so I'm sorry, I'll stop there and you can, and, and we can go from there, <laughs> sorry. I can go no on problem, forever. No problem, no problem, good stuff. Uh -huh. um, Bria, what has your experience been like with COVID-19 and your schooling experience? Yeah, that's a really good um, So luckily I've been fortunate enough to have attended Benilde St. Margaret's High School, which is a private school. And so they already had an online um, educational, educational platform installed that we had been using for prior to this. Um, so I do know that I'm very fortunate in already having a smoother transition um, in which I was still able to learn as we were transitioning through this COVID-19 crisis of sending kids back home, uh, no longer attending school in person. So that was my experience. It was definitely still a little bit of a transition, but um, to have that platform already installed was definitely helpful. Right. Nice. Thank you. Miles, how about you? So um, my experience was a little bit different. Um, it was definitely shocking for all of us, but I would say that it was definitely hard for me to adjust, especially just to the distance learning. It was kind of just all unorganized really at first yeah. because um, I don't think the teachers were expecting any of this either. So I, I don't blame them at all, but um, it was just a lot of different teachers had different um, ways of doing things. And so there wasn't a lot of communication between uh, students and um, teachers as much as I would have thought or would mm -hmm. like. But we were able to manage and in the end it turned out all right. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, um, back to Dr. Eanes. Um, so you mentioned that some of the disproportions within the education system, you know, some people have more access to certain things. So what would you say are the disadvantages that would hit the hardest, um, that have hit the hardest throughout the past few months? Well, so because I'm in New York, I, what I will say is the huge disadvantage, I think for many of us, is our understanding of the economic impact for our families. And so I will say that that comes in in a, diff a lot of different packages. So um, when you have a whole family impacted financially, right, from, a, uh, from an employment standpoint, entrepreneurs, people who uh, work in the restaurant industry, the hotel industry, all these different industries have been impacted in a way that then will have residual impacts to all the things that happen next, right? 
because right. a lot of families and a lot of people just, you know, they plan their life in one way. They're moving along and they think, you know, I'm going to school and I'm working. So how many students now are not able to work? How many parents are not able to work? How many people have businesses, family businesses, right? That are run um, by the family, right? So there's a lot of layers that people, unless you are very in tune to your students, are also in tune to the demographic or the financial situation in your community, we have to keep an eye on that. And mm -hmm. we have to think about innovative ways to understand what our students need to come back. So what I will say, um, in the beginning, the first thing was, do they all have something that they can actually participate in distance learning? You can't assume that all of your students have access to the internet in their homes. Um, right. You can't assume that they all have the right hardware, software, all those different things. So we spent the first month scrambling around trying to be sure that that would happen. And that is a lot of work to say nothing of the fact that you have a lot of faculty and teachers who have not ever um, taught in this distance learning community. So I think some of the patience, right? Planning and mm -hmm. resource management um, that needs to happen has been key. And we also have a lot of people that have made this a political issue rather than an education issue. So for me, it's all about education, but depending on where you're sitting, it's a political issue, right? Because and people which, have now- part of it is? Well, I mean, even this conversation about who's going back to fall and who's not, that yeah. has become a political issue. Um, you know, how will people learn? Will people get a refund because they're distance learning, right? Because some of the states are having students come back and say, we don't want to pay that amount of money if we're not going to be in person. So I think, I think that that has become political, fiscal, and also um, has bordered a little bit, again, back on the social justice issue. Because if we're committed to educating students, to what level are we committed? And how, do, how does that work? Mm -hmm. And who needs to be included in the conversation that will get us from the point where we are now through the struggle, which this is a crisis. I think people you want the crisis to be over very badly, right? Yeah. We, we yeah. are in the crisis. We're not out. They want it to be over. And I get that. Everybody's like, it's summer. Yay, we want to go. Everybody wants to do something fun. I get it. Not so much. This is not fun and it's not pretty. <laughs> um, and I think you're, we're also pushing against that too. Thank you for the question. Yes, sure. Um, Bria or Miles, so for your, um, I know you are both in the class of 20 is, 2020 as well. So how did that kind of affect your last senior experience? Either one of you can go. Um, I'll go. Yeah, I would definitely say it was a um, a transition to say the least. Um, you know, I've been at Benilde St. Margaret's since the seventh grade because they have middle school and high school. And so to spend six years there and then kind of get uh, your senior year cut short was definitely a little, um, little bit of a transition, like I said, but um, I, again, was fortunate to have family, friends, my church family, um, just my network um, to, you know, still, Set love and um, still celebrate, you know, this big moment for sure. So um, to have that though, all the senior festivities kind of gone was was definitely a bit bit of a sad thing. Yeah, yeah, agree. A lot of the same sentiments that she had. Um, spending uh, my whole high school career at Apple Valley and then not being able to. Um, enjoy the senior festivities or even just graduation um, um, like most seniors or students would have. It was, it was difficult. Um, some things were more um, um, hit harder than others when it came to not having them. But at the end, it was, it was, all, it was all interesting just to see how much love and support that we got from outside places like, such as our church family and other um, entities, so it was just, it was all, it was a bit in the end. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I already mentioned that there would definitely be some diff disadvantages to distance learning and different effects like that. Were there any benefits of distance or online learning? Miles, do you want to? 
Um, I would say that on my end, it was um, I definitely struggled when it came to um, school and distance learning. When it came to that, um, I had a hard time just adjusting to not being having a set schedule and just having things structured out for me. So that was pretty difficult for me. Um, the benefit was just that it's just going to give you, um, it just makes you a little bit stronger, a little bit tougher being able to learn in that environment um, so that when you're able to adapt to certain circumstances, that's what I would say. It just gives you a little bit of, I just think it, it, makes you, it gives you a little bit more character being able to yeah. learn that. Yeah, I would definitely agree. Um, one of the main disadvantages for me with online learning was no longer having that opportunity to go in after class, say for those one or two hours and get that mm -hmm. help. Um, I am very good with um, being in person, being able to ask all the questions that I need, and then to no longer have that um, and have set office hours to which the teachers need, need to work with several students um, was definitely a bit of um, a transition, but it was a bit hard, no longer having that avenue to go to. Um, but I will say, and I kind of want to return to a point that Miles had, which was kind of learning how to adapt. That was a very big thing. Um, I think that it's very easy for me. I always like to know, okay, like what's next? Um, like to have my schedule and to where we are right now with this current pandemic, we don't know what's next. There is just an unknown. And so learning how to adapt, one of the things that my dad um, repeatedly tells me is to think on my feet. So, you know, mm -hmm. we're in right now, but, you know, we're all equipped to handle it. And so that has been one of the biggest things is just that transition and continuing to think on our feet and learning how to adapt. Yeah. I, Ayo, I sure. just wanted to make you aware that there's a question that's coming from Facebook and yeah. this is directed towards Dr. Berenicia Johnson Eanes. And the question is, will higher education ever be the same after this mm -hmm. pandemic? Dr. Eads. Thank you for the question. So I actually, my answer is probably yes and no. I do not think that our country has ever survived a national crisis that did not impact higher education. 9-11 impacted higher education. Several other things have impacted higher education. So no, I, I, I would say probably not. Will we learn a lot of lessons? Will we evolve? Um, and will we hopefully be better? Yes, that would be my answer for that. Um, you are going to have a lot of institutions that are going to suffer financially, have to regroup and re-engineer their reality. Um, we're going into a fall now where athletics and other things that require in-person contact are being um, looked at in a very different way. And we have to be mindful that on the other side of that, some of that may not be the same. And, and, and that is not easy, but it's real. Um, so I think my answer would be, I do not think we will ever be the same after COVID, just like we have never been the same after many things. I also do not think that we need to negate the impact of a separate conversation, which is our um, diversity, equity, and inclusion conversation that has come in in the midst of this at a different level. And that's powerful also because it illuminates for many their uh, view of campus diversity, equity, and inclusion. And what does that mean to higher education? Thank you for the question. Yes, um, so kind of adding on to that for that new normal in higher education and even in K through 12 as well, what, um, what qualities do you think people are learning from this that will be applied in the future? So I, is this, I, I'm sorry, should I yes, go ahead? Or, yes. Oh, so, so I think actually um, having um, my own children at home trying to navigate the distance learning situation, I, I think flexibility, um, as our student mentioned, you know, being nimble, being quick on your feet. Mm -hmm. um, also, 
you know, I think that there will be people that have not been as engaged in technology that will be engaged in a different way at a different level because they have to be. Mm -hmm. I think there will also be a space for people to understand that there's so many other things that they can learn uh, via distance learning that they haven't, you know, shortly after COVID hit, we had Harvard as um, offering free courses. We had, right. you know, there's tons of things out there. I think the issue that people have to ask is whether or not they're willing to pivot and embrace, right? The mm -hmm. new opportunity, the new opportunities, or Take are they, it. right? Or are they so, and grief is real. We are all grieving. Huge amount of loss. I've lost family members. I have lost faculty members. I have lost staff members and students to COVID. That so, is devast uh, devastating, right? Um, from, from, from the virus itself. And so I think the impact of grief is real. And I think people may not be paying attention to their mental health and the trauma that they, um, I think what will come out of this is a different view of what we do when a whole bunch of bad stuff happens. And I have been preaching the gospel to many around radical self-care and their understanding of when there is trauma, when there is grief, what is your response? What are you mm -hmm. doing? Are you getting help? Are you seeking, are you able to participate in virtual church service? Are you able to pivot to get the things you need to be okay, to be strong enough to do what you need to do? And I think that's one of the things that our students will come out of here with because they have, everybody is going to have to pivot and change the way they take care of themselves so that they can be, then be ready to meet the challenge of learning, of working, right? You got to be ready. But if you're not ready to take care of yourself in a very aggressive way, um, it will be harder. And I think those of us that are hurt and have fallen down, some of us are just laying down and we got to get up. We got to get up. <laughs> the, the struggle is real. <laughs> yeah. It's real. Yep. It is. It is. Mm -hmm. It is right now. Um, so going off of that, to students who are experiencing that grief and whether it's of family members, friends, or even of just the ex experiences that they thought they may have had. Um, and this is open-ended, anyone can answer. What would be your advice to students who are kind of feeling hopeless in this time, who will have to adjust to learning again in their new normal? What is your advice to them? I'd like to jump in with that. Sure. Um, so I would say, and I'm, I'm really I'm pleased to hear um, that Dr. Johnson Eames said all that about self-care, and I'm not surprised that she said it either, because um, I, I'd like to think that she probably taught me uh, a large part of what I know when it comes to that topic. But I think that in the midst of all of this um, you know, changes and tribulations and having to pivot and embrace, I think it's really important for those students to find um, what may have stayed stable during that time and cling to it as much as they can. So um, relationships, um, pieces of their identity, um, you know, there you, you all mentioned here um, on the panel today, like your church families, like whatever parts of the person's life that have either remained um, stable or maybe have not been impacted as much, I would encourage them to, you know, um, embrace as much of those components as possible and not be afraid to ask for help when it's needed because, you know, like uh, President Ian Sen said, we're all grieving in our own different ways and we're grieving different things. And so knowing that there are people out there and resources out there that are, you know, able, willing and excited to help those who need it, you know, um, and not being scared to ask for those resources and not being, not feeling ashamed about that either. Um, yeah. You know, really, really having that help seeking and not, taking um, uh, shame or um, embarrassment in that I think is really important because the reality is, is since all of us are going through it, you know, chances are that many of us will need more resources than we have right now. So, um, so clinging to what you have and asking for help, I think are two things that are going to be really important during this time. Yeah, great advice. Anyone else? Too. Um, I, I just want to say oh, that, of ahead. course, do all those things. Absolutely. Um, but but to get there, um, I remember one of my favorite childhood movies, uh, Finding Nemo. And mm -hmm. in Finding Nemo, um, they say, just keep swimming. Just keep swimming. 
Um, and I like to use that day to day um, when, when things get tough or I get out of a meeting, I got to do something tough or, you know, I'm sick and tired of being online. I like to have a day with my friends and be in public and uh, go to the state fair in Minnesota. That's the big thing to do and do all these things. You know, how am I going to keep my morale up? How am I going to keep going? You got to just keep swimming. Um, and sometimes right. simple things like that keep me in check and keep me going. Love it. Anyone else? I was just going to say, let me follow up that there's there's two things I want to be sure. Um, I talk to my children about this a lot, but I also talk to my students a lot. You know, you have to think about the habits you're building, whatever your habits are, your coping mechanisms is what's going to help you make it through. So mm -hmm. take yeah. a self-reflection, right? A analysis of, you know, I tell people I take a gospel shower every morning. That means that I put the speaker <laughs> in the bathroom and I pump it up, right? Um, <laughs> because I need it to get my day started, right? So, right. And, and, and you you have to figure out all the different, you know, I, I joined a, a Girls Trek, a Black Women's Health Initiative walking group um, during COVID, right? You gotta figure out what you need to do to cope. So that's number one. The other thing is that all of the students, everybody here, whether it's tax money or tuition, you pay for certain resources. There is a counseling center on campus. There is a registrar's office on campus. There is a, these people are supposed to be there to help you. And if they are not, please utilize the resources of, of the vice president of student affairs, the dean of students, the president, if you need to. If your student body in any education space is not getting services during COVID, just because it's COVID, then you're not getting your money's worth right? Mm -hmm. Because there are people there that are supposed to be providing you with services, whether it's virtual counseling, right? Whatever it may be. And it's to some extent, you have to know your worth and you have to know those resources are there for you. I have too many students, students that come to me and say, I didn't know that office was open. I didn't know this thing existed. I didn't, that's not an answer for us anymore. The tutoring center, the testing center, the counseling center, the health services center, the office of academic affairs for your advisement, whatever it is. In, in the K through 12 space, the same things. Your parents pay taxes or they pay tuition, who knows what? You gotta get your due. You gotta ask for the help because it's there. It's there. Yeah. Thank you, Great sorry if I, went on, if I went on too long, I'm sorry. No, no ma'am. Great advice. That's right. Students, resources are definitely there. So take advantage of them. <laughs> Anybody else? And then I think we will wrap up this section. No? All right. Well, I think we can transition on to the next section. Matthew? Oh, hello again. How has COVID-19 uh, affected students' personal lives? Um, Dr. Thompson, the question for you. Your mic is still muted. No worries. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you, Matthew. Um, so how has COVID-19 affected people's personal lives? Well, I think that that's really on a case-by-case -case basis. I think that, um, you know, for, I think the first, you know, equalizer is whether or not the person has been impacted by, you know, has been has contracted COVID-19, or if someone in their, um, you know, uh, close family, their immediate family, that would be the first kind of determinant as to how much this pandemic has affected them. And if it has, they have a bevy of health issues. Um, you know, they've not probably been able to uh, continue with work, continue with school, you know, um, uh, important milestone events, um, you know, weddings, funerals, graduations, all of these things I think are, are important parts of a personal life. And if you have been, if you've contracted COVID-19 or if a parent has or a sibling has or close friend, grandparent, aunt, uncle, whatever, cousin, you know, any one of those things that I just mentioned could have been changed if not eliminated altogether. Um, so even if the person has not dealt with COVID-19 on a you know, medical level, you know, all of us now have to um, rethink how we connect with others, because that's essentially what COVID-19 has taken away, our, the, the, our ability to take for granted that the, we would be able to 
be next to people. And so to the extent that we have our extroverts out there who really draw energy from being in large groups of people or being around others, even if it's not a large group of people, that's going to infect, affect the person's life. Um, and having to stay in the house for long periods of time and isolate you know, oneself, particularly if they, you know, just live by themselves, or if they, you know, don't have many people in the house that, you know, can affect your mental health, right, depending on the person's temperament, their personality, um, you know, their resources, their uh, access to technology, any one of these things, and things that I can't even think about are going to impact a personal, you know, a person's day to day life. And again, I'm just hoping that, you know, they're reaching out for help and that they're asking questions so that, you know, people outside of that circle can help them cope with those differences. I, I love this idea that Dr. Ains talked about, and I know we're switching gears from the script, um, in terms of this gospel shower. I love this idea. What are some things, some outside of the box things that you would give people as tools as far as boosting morale? Um, and being able to to keep the faith during this time. So um, I think you know people have an opportunity to tap into what is most interesting to them. You know, I I, I love music, and I know to get my day started, it it centers me mentally to do that. Um, so um, you know, I think people have been cooking more during COVID. Hopefully, people have been having virtual Zoom. Um, I have a lot of friends that have a weekly family call with their family. Um, and, and some of the young people have orchestrated that. Um, so just a weekly Zoom with everybody, every everybody, every auntie, every, everybody, just the same time, set the time. Um, I also think people now are trying to figure out how to, um, if they have not already been doing their recreation and their self-care physically, how to get out there and do some more of that. I think that you have to tap into those things you know make you feel good um, I was raised with somebody who did a gospel shower, but he did it differently. My dad <laughs> did, you know, gospel um, gardening. He would work in the yard and have the music blaring mm -hmm. and he would clean the house and have the music. So I, I, I saw that in him. Um, but you have to kind of know what gets you going, right? But also get, helps you feel um, help, um, taken care of. And, 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 and we're so busy. Uh, the self-care thing is not easy um, for any of us. But What's interesting, and this is, you know, um, you know, uh, I, I, Robert Reese, I think, has been the beacon of hope in this area in my life for a very long time. You have to stay grounded with those things that you know in your heart will keep you okay. So that's your spiritual health, your emotional health, your physical health, your family, your friends, and your faith, right? And how are you managing your calendar? Because this is the thing, life will get away from you. How are you managing your day-to-day -day calendar so that it's a priority for you to do something once a day for that, those three things, right? Your physical health, your faith walk, you know, all the, think about it and be intentional. And I think sometimes in COVID for sure, people are not, in, you know, it gets away from you. It's just busy and it's painful, but you do have to make, those, I think, decisions that very much um, put you in a place to have a little bit here and there, right? Very intentional so that you are, you know, taking care of yourself. I love the water. I'm missing swimming because the Y closed. Uh, so that's hard, right? So um, that's hard. Um, some people love to be able to get to the beach or the ocean. That's been hard for a lot of people. Some people mm -hmm. are missing playing basketball because, or sports with people, right? I see, okay. So that's, but yeah. you got to figure out a substitute. You got to figure out a substitute, a make do until you get over the hump. Um, because I think, you know, I told my sisters, you know, you have to set your COVID goals and try to, and I try to tell the students and the staff that too, whatever the three things you want to be sure don't happen. If you want to be sure you don't gain 40 pounds, be sure you don't gain 40 pounds. <laughs> You know, if you want to be sure, if you want to be sure that you read three books and you learned a new language, get it done. You know, it, it will keep you sane <laughs> to set your goal, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to find, mm -hmm. you know, my, mm -hmm. my son is 13 and I, and I tell my husband all the time, I'm like, so when we come out of COVID, is he going to be able to tie a bow tie, tie a real tie, cook some eggs, you know, like what, 
what are we getting done here? <laughs> Everybody's got to figure out what they're trying to get done because it will keep you sane, right? Because when we come out, we can say, you know what? That's what I did for myself during COVID. You know, I studied for my, 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 my um, SAT. I studied for my LSAT. I studied for my MCAT. I made three, you know, I joined a knitting group. I don't know. But it, this figure, figure, once we get to done being sad, because I told somebody about three weeks ago, I'm done being sad. I lost a lot of people in February, March. Mm-hmm. Once you get fighting mad, that's when we get dangerous. Once we go through our stages, <laughs> agree. Mm-hmm. Once you get fighting mad, you can get some stuff done. It's hard because we're going to slip Ooh. back and forth. It's going to slip back and forth. Sometimes it's just sad. Like, I don't want to, who wants to do this? Who wants to go to school online? My kids don't want to go to school online. Nobody wants to go. But, okay. But it is where we are. And we're going to have to figure out how to mobilize ourselves past that. Um, we also have this interesting dynamic around losing our civil rights icons and being in this Black Lives Matter space and being in this space around diversity, equity, inclusion. And if we, I think, do not get serious about our understanding of our position and our commitment, um, it, we will, it will be a tragedy. And we don't need to do that. We don't need to do that. There's a lot of opportunity, a lot of opportunity. Um, I, I wanna make sure that anybody that's watching on Facebook or, or whatever medium you're watching through, we are not um, ignoring the social justice component of that. We have a piece coming up a little bit later, um, but that's definitely the main part of what we're talking about today. So you're gonna hear people talk about that a lot, but we're really gonna get into that for 30 to 35 minutes later in, in the broadcast. Um, Dr. You, back to you, Dr. Thompson. Um, uh, she briefly touched, Ms. Dr. Eanes briefly touched on um, some of the effective ways that you can use this time. We're, we're seeing this period of time as far as being in quarantine and then social distancing and things not being back to normal yet, um, if it will ever be normal, if it will be a new normal or whatever the case may be. Um, and she gave some brief examples. I would ask you to, to do the same and give us some examples, um, some ways that you've seen youth be effective during this time, some ways that you've been effective during this time, um, and some things that people can do to um, restructure themselves um, and take a moment to, to, to find some normality um, in this pandemic? Oh, wow. Um, that's a loaded question. <laughs> that's a lot. That, um, I, I, I think that, you know, I agree with everything that Dr. Eanes just said. And um, off the top of my head, I, I struggle to add to that list because I think it was, it was golden. Um, I think that in terms of like restructuring themselves, I would think that the individual really has to think about what could be different in their life, regardless of whether COVID-19 exists or not, and go in that direction. Um, you know, if we're, especially for students, if there is a particular you know, subject that maybe they've always struggled with or something that they wanna get better at or an activity that doesn't require being around large groups of people, I think that taking this time to go in that direction and really fortify yourself with whatever that may be, I think is really important. I think that um, using this time to repair relationships um, you know, um, you know, uh, maybe not necessarily toxic friendships or, or toxic relationships within the family, but if there are people in your life where, you know, you had an argument once upon a time and can't remember exactly why y'all fought or, you know, a relationship kind of drifted apart and you're not exactly sure why, um, you know, reaching out to that person and letting them know that you're thinking about them and you hope that they're doing okay could be a, a great olive branch, um, you know, uh, I think that, you know, looking at the, like Dr. Eanes mentioned, the habits that are in your life in terms of, um, you know, the kind of people you, who you hang out with, the kind of foods that you eat, um, how late you stay up at night, when you wake up early, when you wake up in the morning, um, all of these things, again, are really up to the person, the individual to kind of look at and assess and really ask themselves, is this working or not? Because what I've noticed about what's happened in our society since, um, you know, February, March, and, and the pandemic started is that things have slowed down for a lot of people. 
you know, we're no longer, you know, moving at that breakneck pace that we were before this started because a lot of stuff has been shut down. And so my hope would be if you're looking to figure out who you can be, you know, once we get past the situ situation is to take advantage of, you know, the downtime, whatever that may be, and figure out how you can use it to your advantage. And I think that, you know, specifics are really up to the individual to figure out like what makes the most sense for them. But I'm hoping, you know, if it's not relationships, if it's not daily habits, if it's not, you know, what they're doing in terms of like activities, school work, that there might be something else that hopefully this panel will spark and you'll think, well, you know, that's something I could do better. I could do different. I could spend more time on. I could reach out for, and maybe that's what I should be doing. And so I think that checking in with loved ones and checking in with people who know you well and asking them, if you have no idea like what that thing might be for yourself, asking people who know you really well, what do you think I could do to take myself to the next level, you know, generally speaking, or in a particular, um, uh, on a particular topic and, and listen to that feedback and try to receive it and try to integrate it as best you can. I think, um, you know, it would be a great start. I think that this moment has given us a second to to pause. Um, and I know that I'm a person from my upbringing, upbringing that even in this global pandemic that is terrible, you have to be able to find the positives and find areas where you can succeed, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I know for me, as far as wanting to be a young, successful Black man, um, something that I've been working on is thinking systematically, right? So you have an issue, you have a problem, how do you put together a system in your mind so you can knock things out um, and, and make that problem solvable? Because um, if you're skipping from thing to thing, you're skipping all over the board and you're not really organized, it's gonna be really hard for you to get things done in whatever field you're working in. Um, so that's personally something that I've been working on very, very longly every day, um, trying to think, how can I be the most effective in each time frame that I'm laying out for myself? Also, um, when things happen like this in the world, there are often times of creation, right? So we've had a couple months here where people could, could have been locked in on this project, um, locked in thinking about this, thinking about that, and that there will be companies, whatever, that will come out of this and be like, you know, this is the time we needed to really zone in on what we were working on and then think about things in an effective way. Also, like, like Dr. Ames uh, harped on a little bit, things probably will have to change. People have to be more effective and the medium that we communicate, how we do things will not be the same probably ever again. But um, that does not mean, oh, we're, you know, of course we, we want, we were okay before, okay. Um, but we have to think about what does the future look like? Um, who are the people that are looking forward and saying, how can I create or invent something that will help improve in the future? Um, how can I be that guide? Um, where will my product run in this market? Um, those type of thoughts, as far as being aggressive, being a creator, are really powerful in a time like this. So I want to make sure anybody that's watching that call is definitely thinking about those things and that um, this is a time where you can lock in. Um, I know personally, it's been about um, redoing my schedule. What time am I getting up? What time am I going to sleep? Um, you know, trying to socialize with friends, but um, there's also goals that I'm trying to make. Um, and, and I'm in that transitioning period, especially being a youth uh, of going from a young man to a man um, and going from a high school student to a college student who's going to have to be independent and be able to handle things on his own. Um, so how do you navigate that? Um, are you mindful in that transition? All these things that I could say that I've definitely been thinking about during this time um, and have definitely tried to harp on. Um, let me get back to our questions here. How has uh, COVID-19 affected you? I know we talked a lot about the youth, but um, how, how has it affected you, Dr. Thompson, uh, specifically? Uh, you know what? I got to be honest with you. Um, I, have, I am, there's, there's a certain amount of privilege that I've been able to relax upon in, in the course of this. And when I say privilege, I mean like I finished all my training you know, I have a stable house, like I have food, I have income, I have a job that I can take, you know, from place to place, you know. Um, so for example, like when we first started, you know, meeting and talking, like I was in the Detroit area and, um, you know, just 
earlier this week, I was in New York and I'm in Washington, D.C. right now. And, you know, my this doesn't impact like my career or my income. And so I have to be um, like honest in saying that my experience is probably very different than a lot of other people's. And I'm very grateful and blessed that my experience has been the way that it has. Um, I think that if anything, it has forced me to be creative with like my lesson planning when I'm teaching students. And it has really um, made me think about how to like stay in contact with like my friends and family, because typically like I'll just go in a hole and try to produce as much as I can and come out like when I'm ready. But, you know, now that things are so different, I recognize that the people in my world, you know, need to hear from me more often and they need, you know, they need me to hear from them. And so um, like resetting like how my mind typically works so that I can be more um, accessible. And because I know that if left to my own devices, I would go do my own thing. But I know that, you know, you really can't, if you live in an interconnected society like we do, you can't do that during times of emergency like this. Um, so um, one of the things that in terms of professional that has happened since this COVID-19 situation started is being um, in New York with, with uh, Dr. Eanes, um, so my graduate students at Fordham University have been were like at different like hospitals and agencies throughout the city, you know, seeing clients and whatnot. And then when the pandemic started, um, a lot of those places had to send my students home because, of course, you know, they, you know, couldn't be there because of liability issues. And so in the wake of that, New York State started a helpline statewide for like front frontline workers as well as like the general population. And so I've been supervising those students who were sent home who are now on that helpline. So I'm not actually taking phone calls, but I'm listening to my students who are taking those phone calls. And I've heard all kinds of stories. And most of them, of course, are sad and, you know, um, and, and, and filled with kind of challenges. And my students are only able to help them to a certain point because it's just a helpline. It's not like typical therapy. And so hearing those stories really makes me really blessed about, you know, where I am and, and what, you know, God has blessed me with and what I've worked hard for and what my family has su supported me to get and made me kind of think about how I can bridge the gap between, you know, myself and those communities that would really benefit from psychological services or just maybe just an extra ear, you know, or extra shoulder. Um, so I'm still trying to figure that out, but that has, in the wake of this pandemic, um, I have had the opportunity to hear like what's going on around me from people who I would never met, people who I never will meet. And it's really, it's really been humbling and eye-opening. I would agree. Um, I know that my mother in raising me has always been big on um, understanding the blessings that are in your life, right? Mm -hmm. so, so understanding um, how, how you can be thankful, what you're thankful for, and not letting that be a Thanksgiving or uh, once a month to Sundays or, or whatever type of deal, letting that be an everyday deal. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that this pandemic has done that for a lot of people as far as having to understand, like you said, your privilege. Um, mm -hmm. You wake up in a household where you don't have to worry about any type of domestic violence. Mm -hmm. You know, there are people that are experiencing that and they're stuck in their houses um, during this pandemic. Um, so there's just all different layers of things that are happening to people and that they have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis um, that is tough. Um, but um, I, I definitely want to make sure that we end on a positive note. And one thing that you said was being that shoulder. Um, and I want to give that to people that are on this, this call that are watching. Um, be a shoulder for your community. Um, do things to help uh, people during this tough time. Um, take this as a call to action. Um, in whatever capacity that you can help in. Maybe, you know, um, being psychology is not your thing. Um, maybe you don't have a degree or a, a doctor's degree. Okay, w what are you educated in? Uh, what can you help in? Uh, what can you do in a safe way to, to contribute to your community so that people are feeling better? What can you do to bo boost the morality of your neighbor? Um, those things in this call to action, I really want people to think about um, personally um, and understand that it's gonna take all hands on deck um, if we're, if we're going to help, help our neighbor. Um, I definitely want to turn it over to Ezra, uh, for our next section. All right. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Cool. Cool. 
Pastor Kevin, you ready? I am ready. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, right. um, cool, cool. So, uh, one of the, for me, that I've seen, you know, over and over and over again on social media, and one of the, the sayings or slogans that I've seen um, on numerous occasions is faith over fear. Um, and we know that COVID-19 and uh, even really just the, the issues that's going on right now, or the climate that's going on right now, um, it, can, it can raise a lot of fear, um, especially with the media and social media um, being the pushers um, of that content, uh, the fear content or the fear factor, knowing that it, 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 it raises ratings or um, likes or shares, or it just causes people to, to, to have that fear factor and it's easier for them to control. So, you know, this section is all about faith. Um, so I really wanna dive into the, the first question, um, which is how have you seen COVID-19 affect youth in their faith? Well, first of all, Ezra, thank you so much for the question. And um, I wanna just, I wanna piggyback on the statement that you just made. I've heard that statement so many times, faith over fear. And I think what's happened a lot of times, people have put more of the emphasis on um, faith removing fear, but scripturally, you know, when you read the scripture, it tells us that perfect love cast out all fear and is that same type of love that produces faith. And so what I try to tell people is that the foundation is love. When you, and then just think about it naturally, when you understand you're in a relationship and we all have parents, you guys have parents. When you know that someone loves you, it doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter what situation you find yourself in. There's something about your faith being built on that love that that person has towards you. So it kind of like eliminates and it removes all the fear. And a lot of times what I tell the young people is that, you know, I try to help them understand the dynamics of the love that God has for you. And in this world, you're going to be faced with a lot of different challenging situations. That's life in and of itself. And Jesus was the best example, but he never for self. Um, he continuously loved and walked in that love. And I think love is a protecting guard. So it even helps guard your mindset and helps you avoid, you know, focusing more on the negative. It, it's not that you don't realize it or you ignore it, but you know how to better manage the challenges that you face. And so I tell them straight up, listen, if you really want to strengthen that faith, and you really want to remove fear, understand how much God really loves you. And I've seen a lot of, I've seen with our uh, youth, um, young adults, a lot of them are struggling with a lot of the things that you guys have already mentioned. I mean, whether that is understanding how to navigate your way through the difficulties of new restrictions and limitations. You know, as young people, um, you know, I think in general, I know myself, I do not like being stuck in the house. And so, COVID-19 and the pandemic has, it, what it did was it, it, it shifted everybody forcefully without any warning. We had no idea that it was coming. So all of a sudden we were in our normal routines and now all of a sudden, hey, you got to stay in the house. You can't go anywhere. In fact, right here in Fort Lauderdale, we just went back on another curfew and we can't go outside the house after 11 o'clock. So it's, it's, wow. it's you know, I've, I've seen a lot of different challenges uh, with our students. Uh, just the day-to-day -day challenges of transitioning from a traditional learning environment to the online and just being mentally um, and psychologically being able to adjust to all of these quick changes. So there's a lot that they're facing. And then you deal with the, I think the relationship aspect. Um, many people are still, you know, they still build relationships through, you know, just that physical touch and that physical environment. And now all of a sudden, you know, I know this generation does a lot of texting and snaps and all the technology ways, but there's still that core group of your inner circle that you like to see face to face. And that can be very challenging when you, especially if you're a people person and you like to be around your friends and all of a sudden it's three and a half months later and you can't talk to your best friend. You can't walk, walk down the street. You cannot drive to the next house and just maybe go to Wild Wings and just have some good food and good conversation, those are things are not happening right now. And so young people are dealing with a lot of things as well as adults, but I think, you know, in and of itself, as young people are growing and transitioning from that um, uh, young adulthood into adulthood from 
you know, high school into college and to the career force. Some of them are dealing with a lot of um, scary moments, you know, where they get a job. You know, you know, some of them are wondering what would school be like for me? And this is their freshman year of college. How will it be living on campus? And it's not the it, they don't have the same expectations that um, I had. You know, I knew what college was going to be like. We didn't have to deal with this. You know, it's very interesting because the same generation that's dealing with the pandemic is the same generation that dealt with 9-11. And so there's some, there's some irony here when you look at um, what this generation is facing. Uh, yeah, I totally, totally agree. Um, uh, so, so TJ, my brother, um, how would you uh, answer this question? Um, how, has, how, how have you seen uh, COVID-19 affect youth uh, in their faith? Um, well, first of all, I want to introduce myself. I'm TJ Taylor. I'm here out of Columbia, um, invited by Ez. So um, I appreciate the opportunity and on fellowship ministry, missionary, excuse me, Baptist Church. I appreciate um, you guys having this forum. I think it's very necessary um, during this time. But what I will say is, as it relates to our faith during this time, I, I think as Christians, this is where we should thrive. You know, uh, the number one excuse is I don't have time to study. I don't have time to get close to God. So during this time, we should utilize each and every um, even piece of technology like Zoom. You know, um, as can attest to this, we've done group studies together. Um, this time I've been saved for over 10 years now, and this is the closest I've been with God. I've never been close to God. My, my walk is getting stronger and stronger by the day. So what I will say is a time like this, this is where our faith should ignite. Our faith comes together in the face of adversity. So when times like this come, we should come together and we should get stronger together. So I don't think we should necessarily backslide, but how are you studying? You know, what are you doing throughout your day? What, what's your schedule like? I think um, the president um, alluded to this earlier, talking about how you should not come out of this quarantine the same way you went in. There is no excuse. Um, so we should take each and every step every day to build our faith, um, to build our knowledge and our, our wisdom in Christ. So for me, this has been one of the most beneficial times in my life as it pertains to my faith. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think that one of the things really when it, when you're talking about the aspect of it affecting uh, the faith of youth, um, you look at the whole social distancing and the quarantine. And I don't really like the word uh, the term social distancing because I feel like you can still be social and distant. I feel like it should be physical distancing. Um, but you know, when you're physically distanced like that, obviously you lose that um, accountability factor. And that is one thing that we as, well, really in our generation and, and everyone really, um, we need that accountability um, because, you know, you need someone in your corner to encourage you. Um, that means to put courage. Um, so you need someone to encourage you um, in times of uncertainty, in times of uh, tribulation and trials. Um, and so as, as it relates to youth, um, I think that, you know, this whole quarantine has really affected the accountability aspect um, of really the faith, as it relates to the faith. Um, and so I want to dive into the, the, next, the next question um, is how could you see the racial issues in America um, affecting the youth's faith? Uh, you know, it's very interesting where we are today. Uh, I am 37 and I can remember distinctly. I mean, the truth is, Ezra, I have had, I can, dis, uh, I can probably tell you that I can recall at least about five to six different encounters with racial, um, that affected me personally, racially. Um, one being my first year of college to the point where I ended, ended up in a situation um, with living in a dorm room with a individual who was racist and it got to, it really got to the point where there was racial tension on the entire campus and the situation almost made headline news. And that was the first time I had ever been in that situation personally. I mean, that was the first time in my life that I ever had to fear for my life and was wondering what would, the, you know, I'm, I literally, no joke, I had a bat beside my bed, my bed at night. I could not even sleep in peace at night because of the 
I, I know how a racist mindset, I know what they think like. And so, you know, it's very disturbing to see the times that we're in now and the issues that we're facing. But as a believer, you know, as I've grown and as I've matured in the faith, one thing that I've, that I've learned is um, I go back to this love, guys, because I, I stress this because we talk about a lot of things and don't understand sometimes how love is the root of, it's the foundation of why Jesus even, even came. It's the reason why God even sacrificed his son. And I think about one of the scriptures in the Bible um, that tells us, if at all possible, live peaceable with all men. And so I think as we, were, as we mature, you know, as a Christian, I'm, I'm intentional about dealing with situations from a place of truth and integrity, but not doing, not managing or dealing with the situation in a way that it escalates or uh, makes matters worse. I'm trying to figure out, you know, how do I bring peace to this situation? And one of the ways when you cannot reach people through a casual conversation, then you have to pray. You know, you, you, you have to, we have to begin to pray for our environment. And then we have to foster these safe and honest conversations where we can respect one another, even if we disagree. I've been a part of conversations recently where I totally disagree with someone and did not like what they said, but we have to understand in life, everyone has a right to their opinion and everyone has a right to choose. We all can choose to live how we want to live, whether it's right or wrong or whether it's something that we agree or disagree with. But I think we, when we understand the art of respect and how to handle people in general, we as believers set the stage to confront the racial tensions. And you know, when God created us, he didn't create just the color, he created mankind, you know, humanity in his image. So as believers, I think it's even important for us to remember that people are watching us. We, we, we have the right to feel how we feel and we are affected by it in many ways, but they're still watching us and how we're going to handle these these issues with racial disparity and injustice and, in, and uh, inequality. And even just understand, like when I look at what's happening in the world and even what happened with George, I saw all the stuff that took place. And guess what? The people have a right to be mad and be angry and upset. But as Christians, the question becomes, how do we respond? And we have to respond with love, truth, integrity, and respect. And so I think one of the things that I've realized over um, dealing with a lot of young people, uh, this generation has not really experienced um, the raci racism in the way that our forefathers experienced it. And I also recognize that this generation is, especially Generation Z, uh, which is, you know, you're 18 and below. And I guess you could add in some of the millennials in that too. But I've also recognized that this particular generation is a no-nonsense generation. They're very passionate about social issues, social causes. And um, unlike the previous generations, they're like, listen, bring what you're going to bring. I'm going to bring what I'm going to bring. And, and so there is a sense of confidence and, and passion that I love with this generation because they are, I believe it is going to be this generation that is going to ensure that the revolution that has already started will, will, will continue and we'll see the results from it. So I think with the youth, I think we just got, we have to help them in their, how they respond, but not, um, not lose who they are in the situation. Let's just guide them and give them some guidelines and parameters. Okay, speak the truth you know, agree, do what you want to do, but this is the way that you're going to do it if you want to see this type of result. I would like to, um, and uh, Pastor Tucker, thank you for that, because that was really powerful and eloquent. And um, I think, with, you know, particularly us as Christians do have to kind of set that example um, for others who are watching us. I totally agree with you. Um, I, I would like to add that um, in terms, like, in terms of preparing young people now for like the racial conflict or racial tension, I should say, one of the things that I would say is to pay attention to your own racial ethnic identity development mm -hmm. and where you are yeah, on so that good. on that development. Because I think that what happened with um, Mr. George Floyd and Mr. Ahmaud Arbery is that these were um, flashpoint events um, that um, kind of push people along in that development, whether they um, realize it or not, you know? Um, and so 
learning your history, whatever racial background you have, right? Black, Latino, or Latinx, Asian, um, you know, white, multiracial, Arab American, Pacific Islander, American Indian, whatever your racial background is, I think it's now is a good time for you to educate yourself on um, your people, the history, and where you personally are, and how the values and customs and traditions that your racial group have established, how they impact you on a personal level. Because that, I think, is going to inform how you respond to the things that are happening in the streets and in our communities now. That's one thing I think is really important. And, and again, that's like your, your individual responsibility to do that research, you know. The second thing that I'd like to um, put out there is that when, like when I was growing up, my parents taught me about race and culture, but they also in some ways um, sheltered me from racial events. You know, I grew up in Hampton, Virginia. And at that time I was thinking it was a very like post-racial area. And I remember going to um, you know, Morehouse College, Atlanta, Georgia, where uh, Mr. Seawood is going in the fall and really kind of bragging about my area and being like, oh, well, we don't have problems with racists in Hampton. We're, you know, we all get along. And it wasn't until I got to be an adult and went back to Hampton and I saw some things that would never, I would never have expected have happened in Hampton when I was growing up. And the reality is they were happening all the while. I was just sheltered from it. And so, you know, between, you know, when I went for college and when I returned, I experienced things in different places of the country, both up north and, you know, Boston, Massachusetts and down south in South Carolina, where I went to graduate school, that were like, oh, I can easily code that as racism. But there was still like that buffer of, well, it's not really happening to me, right? They didn't call me the N-word. So I'm, you know, this isn't, this isn't like in your face 1955 racism. This is like, you know, somewhere in between. And the reality is all of it is, you know, like all of it is painful. So, you know, if you're the kind of person, particularly if you are a person of color and you were like me, where you don't think that these things are happening, I think that checking in with, again, your loved ones and your friends and your colleagues and getting their feedback on what is it that we just experienced? Did I just hear what, did you hear what I heard? Because I think that when you are mindful of what's going on around you, then you can better like cope with it and deal with it. But if you have like those blinders on where, you know, it's not real racism or, you know, they're not really in my face or I'm not on the camera phone right now, so I must be okay. I think that that takes one intelligent set of eyes and ears out of the, out of the mix, right? And that, and that those eyes and ears are you. So it's really important that you kind of educate yourself on, you know, what's going on around you and also think about where are you in your development towards becoming, you know, um, you know, a, a Latinx person or a black person or a white person or a multiracial person that is in tune with the values and customs and traditions that your people have established, because I think that's going to be important for you in dealing with what's going on in 2020 and beyond. Right, I, I would agree. Thank you, Dr. Kip, for those words. Um, yeah. You know, for, for, for me, um, I would say that I first had to get to the, the point of understanding that this whole idea of racism is a heart issue. Um, you know, and for me, you know, it's like what the Bible says, you have to look past the fault to see the need. Um, you know, people who have those uh, isms, the racisms, um, those type of traits within their character that is a heart issue. And so in order to effectively um, minister or evangelize um, to people who, because when you're talking about how it affects your faith, it, it really can strengthen your faith when you have that understanding that it's a, a heart issue. Um, but when you, you know, get to the point of um, ministering or reconciliation, um, I think that in that understanding, is where the, the strength comes in. Um, so you have the strength to, to minister and say, okay, well, um, well, for one, let me back turn. For one, the Bible also says to, it's, it's better for you to take the plank out of your own eye before you take the speck out of your brothers. And so for me, I had to get to the point where I could take out the plank and take out all of the, the, the maybe even the prejudice or whatever I had, ill will, 
towards any other race um, before I could, I could reconcile or really minister um, to their faults and their needs. Um, because it, it's very hard for you. It's, it's like, um, with our, like TJ uh, uh, um, elaborated on, you know, we have a group of friends and every Sunday morning um, and Tuesday and Thursdays, you know, we have prayer and then we, um, uh, we do devotionals. Um, but for me, um, it was one particular devotion um, and prayer where I prayed for our president. And it was, I had to get to a point where I could repent um, for the ill will that I had for him in order for me to, to pray for him. Um, because it's hard for you to kind of, um, uh, uh, for one, we have to pray for him because he is the leader of this nation. And so you don't want any anything that's corrupt, um, especially if it's leading you. Uh, you don't want uh, anything corrupt leading you um, because anything that they say and do can conjure up any war or any um, discord or wickedness. So I, I, I felt the need to really pray for him um, because uh, this is our leader. Um, whether we like it or not, we may not like it. Um, but at the end of the day, this is our leader. Um, and so I had to get to the point where I could take the plank out of my own eye um, and look past the father and see the need um, and, and, and really pray for him and, and pray for those who may have any type of prejudice or racism or any other ism <laughs> uh, uh, towards um, you. Uh, because it, it really is a heart issue. Um, um, and once you get to that understanding that it is a heart issue, you can really um, strengthen your faith or your trust in God uh, to really uh, minister effectively to that need. And so that um, really leads me to the next question, which is how could this period of uncertainty strengthen one's uh, faith? Uh, you know, as I, I think, you know, I think the president said something earlier about opportunities. You know, a crisis has a potential to really disrupt and interrupt our lives. But in every crisis, we have to see that there are uncommon opportunities. And, uh, you know, I, I like quotes um, as a reader. So I'm going to give you two that really stuck with me. And the first one, and I've got it written down here so I, I can give it to you verbatim. But it says, hope is important because it can make the present moment less difficult to bear. If we believe that tomorrow will be better, we can bear the hardship of today. That was by Titch Han. And there's another one that says, tough times never last, but tough people do. And so I think, you know, when we, as we find ourselves in the pandemic and in this crisis, we really have to um, rediscover or perhaps uncover who we really are. Um, you guys have been talking about identifying gifts and talents and finding ways, things that connect to you and finding ways to inspire motivation. You know, motivation will inspire action in us. And if we, if we have the right type of mindset and a positive mindset to, as Matthew said, find the good in the bad, because in every situation, I can assure you, no matter how bad it is, there is a opportunity to grab an amazing treasure out of it. And there's an opportunity to create something Great, and so I, I personally have seen this opportunity for me. Um, how am I going to best maximize my time? You know, working from home and having a little bit more time on my head. I'm looking at, listen, I don't have time to, I, number one, let me tell you the first thing I did, rest it. Because again, like physical, with our physical bodies, it is easy to get into the mode of, oh, I'm just busy, busy, busy. busy. And it's, it, it amazes me how some people equate success to being busy. But being busy doesn't re doesn't equate to results and producing things. And so the first thing that I did was let me take an opportunity to rest, to take a break so I can recover my strength. And, and as I'm resting, guess what's happening? Mentally, my mind is becoming more clear. So now I'm positioning myself to be able to think more clearly and developing a level of mental resilience and fortitude to deal with whatever is going to come. But in all of that, I'm fine. Okay. What goals, what plans did I put in place that I had not yet executed? This is the perfect opportunity for innovation and creativity. And so now I'm taking advantage of these of this time because I can assure you guys, when everything is over, whatever the new normal will be, there's going to come a point where you're not going to have this time. You're not going to have this downtime that you have. And so I, my challenge to you guys are, you know, 
re um, rediscover or uncover who you are and identify those unique um, skills and talents that God has given you, um, perhaps you guys been you've been sitting on a creative entrepreneurial idea that you hadn't done that you hadn't launched yet. Uh, perhaps you had the idea, but you hadn't facilitated all the research yet that you need to in order to put together the right strategy and the right plan. Um, that's the great thing about faith is sometimes you in moments like this, this is the moment where it's time to jump. I don't have time in this in this in this pandemic and when things are uncertain to wonder how everyone else is going to respond. I don't listen. I got kids. I have a wife. I have people to feed. So I have to take care of me. I got volunteers that I oversee. I have young people that I oversee. I have to look out also for those that I'm overseeing and those that I'm leading. So I have to inspire. I have to be self-motivated in many ways. And, and, and then take that motivation and inspire action in the minds and in the hearts of other people and just reminding them, guys, if you made it through yesterday, I'm certain you can make it through today. Um, we have gotten the custom over these last three and a half months that now we have, it is not our past normal, but the last three months have been the normal for us. So to say that you still, you don't know how to cope with and manage through three months later, listen, it's time to now become very intentional as one, as the president said earlier, we must be extremely intentional. And now this is your opportunity for your willpower to be tested. Talking about your faith now, because when we talk about faith, it's not just, but there are many people that are believing for faith and, you know, executing faith in different areas. Some are believing faith for finances to find a new job when they just lost their job. Some, are, some it is faith to understand what is happening. It is faith to charter a new journey. Um, it is faith to build a business, faith to raise a family, faith to do what you guys are doing now, to, put, to host this event took faith. And it took a strategy. And then once, once you demonstrated the faith and you created the strategy, then it's time to act. And so Ezra, this, this time for me, I told my young people and the millennials that I mentored, even just my regular friends and family, the, I, this quarantine would not be wasted for Kevin Tucker. This would not be wasted. I'm coming out of this greater than I, than, than I went in. I'm coming out stronger. I'm coming out better. I'm coming out wiser. I'm coming out with more peace. I'm coming out with more resilience. And so now I'm like, no, this time would not be wasted for me. This is the prime opportunity for us to thrive. I think uh, Matthew might've mentioned that earlier. This is, the, this is the moment where your faith is really going to thrive. Faith is only necessary in difficult situations. You don't need faith if you can handle this by yourself. And so now I'm looking like, God, listen, I'm going to put it. And this is what I'll leave you with, Ezra. Jeremiah 29 and 11 um, says, I know the thoughts and the plans that I have toward you to give you hope, a future, and an expected end. But earlier in October 2019, I shared with my team that God spoke to me about 2020. And he told me to read Jeremiah 29 and 11, the message translation. And it says, I know what I'm doing. I have it planned out. Plans to take care of you and plans to prosper you and to give you the future that you hope for. The only way that you're going to embrace that future that God has given us is that you got to participate and be, and be motivated to make something happen. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, faith is like Wi-Fi, you know, it's invisible, but it has the power to connect us uh, to that source. So which is the source is, is Jesus, you know, in order to have yeah. faith, which means to trust you have to believe in the thing that you want to trust in. So we have faith in Jesus because we believe that uh, God raised him from the dead. And so once we have that faith and we strengthen it, uh, we can utilize it now in this quarantine. But when, um, when we get out, you know, we'll have that faith to endure even the trials after this. So I want to pass it over to Matthew. Oh, go ahead. Well, go ahead. Ezra, can, I add, can I add one thing right there before you pass it to Matthew? I think Dr. Kip um, mentioned this earlier, but I want to really stress this, guys. This is an opportunity for you to develop new practices, new behavior practices, new thinking patterns. Uh, change. This is this is an opportunity. You, you have to the way you have to look at this this moment that we're in is this is a fresh start. Everything shifted, and the comfort is in knowing that you're not in the boat by yourself. You ain't on the ship by yourself. So listen, if like if someone was trying to lose weight and everybody around them just gained weight, listen, we all in the same ship. Listen, I'm gonna eat less. You're gonna eat less. I'm gonna work out. You're gonna work out. This, you don't have to feel 
embarrassed or you don't have to feel like you stuck. Trust me, this is a fresh start. All of us are at the same, we're at the same stage during the pandemic and all of us are at the start. We're right now at the start and it's up to you to decide if you're gonna get to the finish line. And while you're running, if you, I ran track, so if you're doing a four by four, remember you got friends that are connected to you. You got other peers that are connected to you. You got family members that are connected to you. So you have to be able to start the race, but be able to bring somebody along with you and pass that baton. And now all of us are gonna cross that finish line at some point. We may not cross it together, but the goal is when I cross, you're gonna cross. If you don't cross at the same time, I'm gonna wait on you to watch you cross over. So just to take advantage of this opportunity. New, mind, new thinking patterns, new behavior practices. Just take the, just embrace and get excited that you got a fresh new opportunity to do something in a way that you've never done it before. Agreed, 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 agreed. So we're gonna pass it off to Matthew for the, the next uh, section. Can't hear you, Matthew. Uh, I think your mic is uh, covered up. It might be covered up. No. <laughs> um. Um. Keep trying. I don't know. I until he gets it um squared away. You want to go ahead and start. Yeah. Um, all right. So while Matthew figures that out, we are going to move to our sort of social justice portion. So we can't talk about everything that's going on in this world without addressing the racial justice issues that have been brought to light recently. Um, you know, this year and in the past few months, we've had several situations. Um, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and the one that really, I would say, sort of prompted a, um, I don't even know what you would call it, but it sparked something, is George Floyd, um, the death of George Floyd. And for others who are here in Minnesota, that happened right here in Minneapolis. So right now, um, I would just like to go around, I think, and just say, what was your reaction um, when you heard what happened to George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd, as well as, um, yeah, what was your reaction? For me, when I first heard it, I was one, shocked, but also it was familiar. Um, and then it was also just a different level because it was 15 minutes away from where I am maybe. So um, yeah, it was pretty, yeah, it's close. So I was in shock personally. Anybody else wanna share their initial thoughts, initial feelings? I'll say for me, the, the first word that comes to my mind is traumatic, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, it was very hard to watch. It was out, the video surfaced for like two weeks maybe, and I didn't watch it. I didn't watch it, I didn't wanna look at any pictures cause I just didn't, for my mental health, my mental capacity, I just felt like that's not something I should watch. And there is no other way to call it. That is a modern day lynching. There is no other way to frame it. That is modern day lynching in broad daylight. You know, just the most, you don't you even think about the humanity of it. He's just, the, the guy has his knee on his neck. And I think one thing that bothered me more so even, even more was the officers standing around. Um, I think they are just as accountable, is just as ugly as them to stand around and not have any level of accountability um, just as much as the one that has his knee on his neck. So for me, it's to, to kind of digest all that. It's really tough. It is really yeah. tough. Mm -hmm. um, even for civilians, I feel like if they try to interfere, they fear their life. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You know, they, and they mm -hmm. almost view the police as this, this mafia, like this, 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 this gang that's trying to take over the world. So a lot of times civilians don't even want to get in the middle of it um, because they fear for their life. So, but not to put a label over the entire policing system, because obviously um, it's not everybody. And I don't even, you know, talking about defunding the police and all this other foolishness. We just have to get to the root of the issue to address the ones who are causing these problems. 
we have to hold these officers accountable. So for me, again, like I said, the, the word I think of is very traumatic. I, I tend to think of my uncle, my dad, you know, my, my, my brothers, my, my you know, cousins. Those are the people that I think about when I see a video like that. So for it to even to be broadcasted, I think we even look at the, you know, the different time frame we're in now. You know, back in the day, this happened often, but now we have cameras. We have phones, we can't record. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. now this video, again, is, it just keeps resurfacing and everybody is seeing it and it's just, it's hard, it's really hard to kind of process. So for me, that, that was a very hard thing to watch. I will say for me, I was just, I was like, not again, you know, not, again. Uh, not another um, life taken, uh, you know, I look at, each of us as brothers and sisters, um, especially if we're in the body of Christ, whether it's white or black, but specifically, you know, uh, within our race, you know, I look at you guys as brothers and sisters. Um, and then, you know, for me, if I were to see one of my brothers or sisters um, being in a position of near death, um, I think that anyone would feel some type of way once you have that, that ideology, you know, that we all are brothers and sisters. So for me, it was just, it was, um, it was heart wrenching. Um, at first, like TJ said, I couldn't watch it. I didn't want to, um, you know, like the Bible says, to guard your heart um, for out of it flows the issues of life. So I didn't want to watch that because I wanted to guard my heart because I know me um, and I wasn't in the place uh, uh, strength wise to handle that because I, I didn't want to go off on a tangent. Um, but, you know, I, I, I did uh, later on watch it. Um, just little clips and, uh, you know, I just can't fathom uh, anyone kneeling on anyone. It doesn't matter if it's black or white, um, uh, Asian or Hispanic, kneeling on someone's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. That is like, that is the lowest of the low. You know, there's, there's no way you, you, you know, that race wouldn't even do that to their dogs. And for you to do that, to an innocent right. life, you know, uh, for eight minutes and and feel no remorse, uh, uh, you know, feel as though that you're a tough guy, um, you know, it's very, uh, very um, disheartening. So for me, it was, it was just like, not again, um, but yeah, that's how, that's really how I felt. Thank you. Um, I would say, um, that I was tired um, and I, so I used my social platform um, to kind of voice how I, I felt essentially. Um, within my, my school that I attended, it's a predominantly white institution. And so I knew what community that I had and I knew um, the previous platforms that I've spoken on before. And so to share my voice, but the main thing was just being tired. Um, and that it was just a week of just feeling down, um, kind of feeling hopeless a little bit. Um, like there is just, there's no change. It's the continuous thing. Um, but I did, uh, it definitely helped to just communicate that, um, to reflect upon that, to talk with my family about that because we all have different perspectives about how we're dealing with these types of situations. And I think that was one of the biggest things that helped me um, was just to speak on it because when you have something like this happening over and over and over and over again, and then you see it in your backyard, just 20 minutes away, feels like it could continue to happen to you could happen to your brothers it could happen to your cousin um and so that was the biggest thing is just that fear that have um, reinstilled in me when I watched that video and for I feel like the younger community you know we're all on these social platforms and everyone is wanting to spread the word spread this information spread what happened um, and so to see it on so many different platforms to see the video continuously, uh, I think that was the biggest thing, and I want to return actually back to, I think it was one of Dr. Johnson Ean's points, and, you know, knowing when to cover yourself and knowing 
um, how to, you know, make sure that you're mentally healthy. Yeah. Um, something like that, you, you definitely, it's just important to kind of step back um, and reflect on those types of situations. Right. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just going off of that, seeing seeing the video, um, people are saying how it was traumatic seeing that to even see it once is traumatic. And then um, people are trying to spread awareness, right? They're trying to show, oh, this is horrible. But to see that every day on every platform is also another form of trauma in itself. Um, so yeah, that was also a huge shock. Miles, how about you? Um, so for me, it was um, it was a feeling of helplessness. Um, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't say I was shocked because um, this is a familiar feeling. I mean, it's happened over and over again, and even in this very city that we call home in Minneapolis, a few years ago with Jamar Clark, and even with Philando Castile. So um, it was just a feeling of anger. I was feeling anger. But also, I was, um, I felt compelled to do something about it. And um, not in a way of going out and causing an uproar, but it was time to be, make change. Um, we're all tired, like Bria said, we're tired of this happening. We're tired of seeing this. And over and over again, it feels like we all just go to our phone, tweet about it. And then after a few months, it goes away. And this was not something that we wanted to let just slide under the rug like it has been for the past few times. Um, so I felt like it was uh, even following the video being released and all that, it was an immediate call to action across the board when it came to not just social media, but um, the protests and et cetera. Um, and I don't know, it was just draining. It was very draining, um, especially just to see it played over and over again. And following the videos of Ahmaud Arbery and even the Breonna Taylor, um, it was very um, draining and yeah, we were tired. I was tired, I was angry, yeah. Yeah, I understand that, um, Matt. There we go. You can hear me? Yes. Good, it wasn't showing up. I'm like, oh man, they still can't hear me. <laughs> Um, but I want to quickly get into um, when we're talking about aftermath, especially here. Um, I want to talk about you know some of the positives that came out of that, right? So mm -hmm. we understand that there was definitely a period of uncertainty. There was definitely a period uh, for I know like two weeks here in Minneapolis um, where where things were really wild, right? Um, and it was tough to get a grip on things and we're still in the middle of this global pandemic and what's, it was a lot of things going on at once. Um, but now we're moved from that and, and, and a little bit fur further from that, we see that um, not only is this not going away, but that people are taking the right steps in terms of uh, what they're doing to move forward, right? So I, I, I go and watch TV, I hear a commercial and I think it's Oprah and T.D. Jakes um, that they put the money together to say, you know, the time is now for policy changes. And I know for me, that's been something that's personally been on my heart um, as far as um, understanding, if you really understand your history, if you really understand how the civil rights movement was successful is that, yes, there were protests, there was people in the streets protesting, but that they were protesting for a purpose. Uh, and that there were people um, fighting for that legislation um, to make sure that these changes were long lasting. Um, and with the recent death of John Lewis, who embodied that to the fullest, um, and, and his quote that I shared with you guys earlier is on the Just Action Coalition's website, because um, in my mind, um, he is the person that really, really headed that charge as far as legislation. Um, and you need to think about those things as far as we have a moment here in time where Minneapolis, Minnesota is not just um, in the national eye, the local eye, whatever. We're in the world's eye. Um, and we are ground zero for this movement right now. Uh, what are we doing as far as legislation to uh, get some things passed and, and to fix these problems? Also, we have to understand that, you know, police reform as far as um, what we're doing there and, and all the acts that we put into place in the special session that they're in right now and how they're gonna figure those things out, um, that's huge. 
But once we get past there, there are pressing issues that we need people working on, people thinking about um, as far as making sure that we are fighting this system, um, this systematic racism as efficiently as possible and as systematically as possible. Um, so I wanna leave you guys with that. And also um, to form that as a question, what are some things that you guys are thinking of um, it could be inside police reform, it could be outside of police reform, um, as far as ideas going forward, how we can move forward. Um, I know for me, uh, and well, I'll start by saying that, you know, God has uh, graced um, my family company um, in partnership with Global Star Media um, to produce a movie that really deals with um, the civil unrest. It really deals with um, police brutality, but really the, the social issues that we face um, today. Um, this movie is a movie that reverses the roles. So um, whites are the majority, I mean the minority and blacks are the um, majority. And so it really, it really makes um, because it's hard to really sympathize or empathize for someone uh, when you don't understand their reality, when you don't understand their perspective, right? And so this movie really kind of flips um, the realities and reverses the roles. Um, and it, it, it allows you to see from a different lens. It allows you to see from a different perspective. Um, and it leaves uh, both sides of the spectrum without excuse, um, you know, so as it relates to me um, and, and, and this movie, in regards to this movie, you know, this is a solution um, that we've uh, been really, especially led by God um, to, to put out uh, to the masses um, and really to bring out the issues. Um, and the movie is called Negative Exposure. Um, I didn't mention that. Uh, but to really bring out the issues, um, provide a solution which is God, which is Jesus, um, to point um, all issues, whether it's uh, racism, um, prejudice, whatever it may be, whatever you feel in your heart, um, this movie is to really minister to um, the heart of, of the people um, and to point them and direct them um, to God, to Jesus, the only one who can really fix the heart. Um, and so when we're talking about, you know, police brutality and uh, uh racial injustice and social injustice and civil unrest and these type of issues that we deal with, um, this movie is really a solution to that. Um, and so as far as me, you know, this is what um, I've really contributed to the cause. Um, so, yeah. I think what, one thing I will say is that um, before we go out and try to, you know, ignite change in our community, we have to educate ourselves. Um, I think that's an, a step that we, a lot of times that we skip, we go out and we march with these organizations, but what do these organizations stand for? What are the schemes in that? What are, what are the ideas with that? So are we educating ourselves to go out and do these, you know, these protests or whatever we're doing? And I think our voice is an overlooked aspect as well. You know, kicking down a door and, and busting open a window is not going to create change. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's not you. You fulfilling the image that they already have of us. What does that do? You know, they already think of us as, you know, heathens and as these, you know, these violent people. So what are we going to go out and do? Be violent? I don't think so. So you can't you can't solve violence with more violence. Um, so I think that's one thing that we have to be mindful of, um, because passion without a plan does not create change. We can have passion all day we want. I love, I love the passion. I love the fact that we're passionate about these issues, but what is the plan? And is the plan something that is comprehensive that we can carry on, um, not only during this time, but to the next generation? Because we look at even, I guess, the trajectory of these, of these protests and stuff, it was handled differently, well, in some way, shape, or form, had a different stance in each generation um, that's kind of conducive to the time. So we have to figure out what works during this time frame. And um, I think that's one thing we have to do. So I think my, my big point is we have to educate ourselves, um, create these organizations, these, co these coalitions that when we can come together and actually use our voices. 
things like this. Um, this is something that is a prime example of it. Um, you know, black men and women coming together to address these issues. Um, so we have so many other ways to use our voice, but we have to resort, we have to learn how to get to those, um, to those ways where we can use them. And even as I, as I was talking about, you know, these people are talking about defunding the police. It's not, we're not gonna say defund the police, but what are we funding? Because what do the police do? They have a lot of interactions with homeless people. Let's, fu let's fund the homeless shelter. Let's, form, like, let's fund the, um, the drug rehab center, places that the people need. So it's not all about defunding something, but what are we funding? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. All right, um, to go off of that, <clears throat> one moment. So yes, I do hear everything that you're saying and I agree, um, we do need to educate ourselves, we need to figure out plans. But one thing that I will say is um, while violence and things, it's not ideal, it does grab attention. And um, in order to be heard in a system that is not built for us, um, sometimes somebody does need to take that step and get attention in order for everyone else to be heard, um, in order for attention to be brought to an issue as well. So yes, I definitely agree with everything that you're saying, but also I feel like if all of this um, uprising has, um, if that hadn't happened, I don't know if the same amount of action would be being taken right now. So that is what I'll say, but good points as well. I am. I uh, yes. Listen, I got a question from the audience, and mm -hmm. this question is uh, directed at Ezra. And the question is, uh, the movie sounds phenomenal. Uh, can you let the audience know when and how they can access and support the movie? So once again, the movie's name is Negative Exposure. Um, it'll be uh, available um, on August 8th at 8, so 0808 at 8. Um, and, and, you know, at the, at the end of the movie, I kind of don't want to try, I want to pose it without giving away, um, but it's really a call to action. Um, there's a call to action resolution um, that we um, as youth or young adults can really uh, gravitate to and get involved in uh, as it relates to our communities, um, especially nationwide. Um, and I, and I, I want to say this, I really like this image, you know, with six young adults, um, bright young adults who have a voice and who, who are coming together to bring about change. Um, I think that's very, very powerful. Um, but, you know, as it relates to this, this movie, um, there is a call to action or a resolution um, I don't want to give it away what it's called. Um, I don't know if I can, um, but yeah, it, it really just, uh, um, just gives the young adults, the youth, um, or, or anyone with a voice, the opportunity to grab on to a hold to this, um, um, and implement it into their communities, um, as it relates to, you know, police brutality or, um, any other uh, reform, whether it's community or criminal justice, um, this, this, this resolution really um, can take place in our communities if we just grab a hold to it um, and implement it. So yeah, 0808. Sounds great. We can't, we can't hear you. Can't hear you again, Matthew. <laughs> You can hear you, but it keeps going in and out. Wait, try to talk again. Hello, hello, hello. Okay, a little bit. Just keep talking. Um, I want to go off of TJ's yeah. last point as far as, you know, um, defunding with a purpose. So that's a big conversation right now as far as um, anything that we're doing in the in the tide of reversing this 400 year, you know, built system, we have to be really, really thoughtful in that process, right? Um, and understanding that, like he said, um, maybe putting the money somewhere else is what we mean when we say that. Um, and also, um, we have to be really thoughtful as far as what policing looks like in the future. 
Um, how does it shift? How does it change? Because it has to change. Um, and what technical solutions, key technical solutions are we putting in place so that we can um, make sure that people are safer, uh, make sure that policing is better and that they're handling these high pressure situations um, in a better way. Also, um, I mean, uh, part of what I'm doing with the Just Action Coalition is, is making sure that we're looking at policing in, in a full light, right? So um, not just the technical solutions, but what are we doing as far as the selection process on the training process and then more training and mental health awareness on the job, um, making sure that these officers are well equipped um, from, from every standpoint. So not only are we selecting the people that are um, not racially biased, um, people that are understanding of their position, um, are, we, are we funding the right tools so that um, exactly like you were saying with homeless people, if, if that's a problem that we're facing as far as um, those interactions, maybe there needs to be a separate force that's dealing with that. Um, and that when we're bringing out the police, it's for a certain number of issues, um, not just, you know, home, some homeless issue or something like that. So um, when we're doing meaningful, we're being meaningful, we're being thoughtful, it has to be very thorough. Um, and I think that's something we have to look at in this process is when ideas are brought up, what are the best ways that we can go about this? Um, and understand that, um, you know, sometimes we're in a time where the hot topic is what we're talking about. The hot topic is racism. And, and, and and to get those views often, people would like to rush through um, these processes to say that they've done something. Um, when in reality, it takes time. Um, so these changes that we want in our society, they take time, they, think, they take thought. Um, and now uh, that the movement before us didn't have, our movement has technology. So it takes understanding how do we use this technology effectively um, in this time to, to get the basis of numbers and factual evidence and data um, that it's managed by itself. Um, I'll leave you with this last idea. So as far as police reform goes, are we thinking, well, if there's a metric where we're measuring uh, the performance of police departments in all aspects, so that we can look at and see, well, they should be doing this better. They should be doing this better. Um, they're over policing here. These are where our problems are. We need to fix them this way. Um, those, that type of metric is very helpful and it's possible with the technology that we have now. So we have to be thinking of technical solutions that will do some of the work for us and that will be the basis of our legislation and, and our speeches or whatever about it moving forward. Can I, um, can I say this? Um, uh, and and well, first I'll start by saying, Matthew, I love what you're doing um, um, in your community. Uh, uh, as it relates to the reform of criminal justice, I mean, I think that's 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 majorly important, especially in your community, having the fact that this event that just took place and it reached people globally, it literally happened in you guys' backyard. It happened in you guys' home. Uh, and so, you know, I really commend you for using your voice um, and, and, and taking and doing what it takes to get the proper knowledge um, so that you can pose um, uh, different solutions to, uh, as it relates to legislation. Um, but I would say, you know, we came together, you know, us as young adults or youth um, came together for one cause, to bring change. Um, but I will pose something um, for us to think about as it relates to, um, youth and young adults nationwide. Um, because I think that if we were to come together um, and utilize our voice um, as one, as one body, um, I think that it would be very effective. Um, because it's one thing to hear the cries um, and, and, and to hear the necessities um, as it relates to these issues from adults, but it's another thing to hear it uh, from young adults, from us, um, our generation. And so I really believe that, you know, we, 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 we should broaden like a, a coalition uh, or a national youth coalition to where we, we really come together, whether it be every other month or every month, and, and um, talk about the issues that we face, the biggest issue that we face or, or that we hopefully we won't face, um, 
uh, but many do in, in our generation is student loan debt. That is like the major issue um, um, that we, you know, we face. Um, and there's other issues, but I feel like if we were to come together nationwide um, as a coalition and, and, and put all of our issues in one pot and, and, and we can take those issues, form a solution and pose them to legislation and say, this is what we, we would want to see. Um, this is what we want you um, to do um, as it relates to us. And if you cannot do these things, then you cannot get our vote. And I, I think that that is how we going forward could and, and maybe should utilize our voices if we just come together. Um, because it's a powerful, powerful thing. I've seen it happen. It's a powerful thing when youth and young adults come together and pose their issues. You know, it's, it's a powerful thing that we utilize our voice. So I want, I, I would like for this to go farther than just you know, a six um, um, on live. Um, I, I think that this can really go farther than what we may um, think. Uh, if we can just come together uh, and, and think about the, the how to go about doing it, the plan, the call to action, these are the type of things um, that I think that we should really uh, think about as it relates to this national youth coalition. Agreed. And um, we do have to wrap up here. But one thing that I do want to say before we go is that for um, any other youth who may be watching, older than us, younger than us, it doesn't matter, um, never doubt the power of your voice. Um, and it doesn't matter what scale that is on. It doesn't matter if you are um, addressing racism in your schools to your friend group. It doesn't matter if it's in front of hundreds or thousands of people posting it online, whatever. Um, your voice is powerful, it's valuable, and people need to hear it. So use it, get out there, and um, yeah, never doubt the power of that. And then, um, yeah, I think we can wrap up. Thank you so much to Dr. Berenicia Johnson Eanes, Dr. Kip, um, Pastor Kevin Tucker. We so appreciate you all being on here. Thank you to our youth guests who came and gave input. We just, we really appreciate it. And this has been a great discussion. So um, we appreciate y'all. Thank you for listening. Thank you for commenting. And yeah, Matthew, is there anything else y'all wanna say? Uh, thank you to everybody who was behind the scenes as well. Uh, we yes. understand that with any event, um, those people are definitely uh, really helpful in this process and are the big parts of this event. So we want to um, mm -hmm. definitely, if you're behind the scenes, please give yourself a, a pat on the back and understand that we're very thankful um, for you being a part of this event. Um, and for those listening um, in the Facebook Live, thank you for tuning on. We hope that you took today um, not just some conversation, but some action. Uh, where do you fit in, in terms of combating this, this double pandemic of racism and COVID-19? Um, take some action with you and be blessed. Yeah, and I would, you know, ditto, I would say that, you know, this conversation uh, was extremely, extremely uh, important. Um, I keep getting a text saying that people are asking, uh, for the website for the movie is www.negativeexposuremovie.com, negativeexposuremovie.com. Um, but yeah, as it relates to this convo, I mean, I, I think that this is extremely important, extremely needed. Um, and I would, like I said, I would just pose to us and the youth and young adults that are watching and will watch after this um, ceases. Uh, so let's go far farther, let's go higher, um, let's broaden the spectrum, let's broaden um, our ideas and our, ideolo our ideologies and practices. Um, and, and, and let's utilize our voice. Like Ayo said, um, don't neglect to utilize your voice. You have a voice, whether or not you believe it or, um, or not, you, you really do have a voice. Um, and so let's continue to go higher. That's right. All right, well, um, thank you everybody. Be blessed. We can end it. <laughs>